Orthodox ecumenists are not only disobedient to the Orthodox Church, they also openly charge her with a sin of division. True, they attribute this sin not only to the Orthodox Church, but to all churches of other confessions as well. Yet it was heretics who created heresy, not the Orthodox Church. On the contrary, the Orthodox Church has defended, with the blood of her martyrs, the purity of the Orthodox faith from heresies. Had the Church not struggled thusly, then Orthodox truth, through its having intermingled with heretical falsehood, would have ceased to exist, and together with it the Orthodox Church would have vanished from off the face of the earth. One cannot fault the Orthodox Church for not mingling with heretics and for separating herself from them. Rather, one must bless her for her martyric decision to make such a division, a division that occurred because of the heretics' rebellion against the Church, against God-revealed and patristic truths, and even against God Himself. However, The fact that Acumenus even makes such an accusation shows just how great are the sins of audacity, self-opinion, and pride into which they have fallen. They have appropriated for themselves the right to judge the Orthodox Church. It appears that the time has come when one can no longer be silent. One must show the Acumenus the whole of their error in equating Orthodoxy with other creeds, and one must caution them against the dangerous and ruinous path that they are treading, a path that has incited them to disobedience and even to public accusations against their mother, the Church. Finally, one must not fail to bring attention to the negative impact the participation of Orthodox representatives at ecumenical conferences has. Their presence at these conferences confirms heterodox Christians in their belief that all Christian confessions belong to the one Ecumenical Orthodox Church. For our part, we do not consider the presence of Orthodox ecumenists at ecumenical gatherings to signify at all that Christians of other creeds belong to the true Church of Christ. Just as far from the truth of the Orthodox faith as they are on account of their religious errors, so do they remain. Orthodox representation at ecumenical conferences simply informs us that the Orthodox have begun to fall away from their Orthodoxy. It is difficult to decide where Orthodox fall away from the Orthodox Church more, in their writings or by their presence at ecumenical conferences. Their presence at ecumenical gatherings is, in essence, a betrayal of the Orthodox teaching on the Church expressed in the ninth article of the Creed. Orthodox representation at such gatherings, which ecumenists call all church conferences, meetings of Christian churches, and the one holy church of Christ, is, to all intents and purposes, a confirmation of the Orthodox Church being the one holy church of Christ, together with every heretical heir. Consequently, without one word, without anything written, Orthodox representatives, merely by their presence at the Amsterdam Conference, will be contributing to the subversion of our faith in the dogma of the Church. In addition, joint prayer of Orthodox with heretics occurs at all of the ecumenical conferences. Joint prayers are, however, forbidden by the holy canons of our Church. The Tenth Apostolic Canon says, If one shall pray, even in a private house, With an excommunicated person, let him also be excommunicated. And the 45th Apostolic Canon states, Let a bishop, presbyter, or deacon, who has only prayed with heretics, be excommunicated. But if he has permitted them to perform any clerical office, let him be deposed. In his commentary on this latter canon, Bishop Johann of Smolensk writes, The canons strive not only to preserve the Orthodox from becoming infected with a heretical spirit, but also to preserve them from indifference to the faith and to the Orthodox Church, which easily arises from having contact in matters of the faith with heretics. This canon, however, does not contradict in any way the Christian spirit of love and tolerance that distinguishes the Orthodox Church. 
There is a great difference between tolerating those errant in the faith and living with them peacefully in a civic community and entering indiscriminately into religious contact with them, inasmuch as the latter action signifies that we are not only not trying to bring them to orthodoxy, but that we ourselves are weakening in the faith. In regard to this commentary by Bishop Johann of Smolensk, On the previously cited canonical regulations, one needs to keep in mind the following thought of St. Cyprian of Carthage, who maintains that heretics will never come to the church if we strengthen them in their beliefs that they also are members of the church and possessors of the mysteries. There is only one instance in which Orthodox representatives can be present at ecumenical conferences, and that is if the conference organizers were to announce to the Orthodox Church on behalf of all the so-called Christian churches, the members of the ecumenical movement, a readiness to renounce all of their heretical delusions and reunite themselves with the Orthodox faith. But of course, those in charge of ecumenical conferences have never made any such announcements, nor will they ever do so, because heterodox Christians, in general, simply do not think about renouncing their heresies and reuniting themselves with the Orthodox faith. One should not forget how stubbornly and fanatically heretics hold on to their religious convictions. Reunion with the Orthodox Church, as reality shows, occurs only in isolated cases, very rare and exceptional ones. Let us always remember the prophetic words of Christ. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? In view of all this, we have no grounds on which to hope for a reunion of other so-called Christian churches with the faith of the Orthodox Church. Instead, we should anticipate a greater and greater reduction in the numbers of the true faithful. The very head of the Ecumenical Council has no conception of Christians of various creeds reuniting with the Orthodox faith. Through his personal assistant, William Adolf Wiesert Hooft, He has clearly announced that the Ecumenical Council will not constitute a centralized form of ecclesiastical unity in which denominations would lose their independence and distinctive character. Thus, at ecumenical conferences, the questions of the reunion of non-Orthodox churches with the Orthodox Church is not even raised. In the programs of ecumenical conferences, this issue is never on the agenda, nor is it included in the agendum of the upcoming Amsterdam conference. It is true that, at their conferences, ecumenists, both heterodox and orthodox, try to find points of commonality in their faiths in order to attain, insofar as this is possible, unity. A significant letter signed by all of the attendees at the Oxford Life and Work Conference 1937 states, We are one in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, as the embodied Word of God. We are one in our commitment to Him, the Head of the Church, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We are one in the confession that this commitment takes priority over all other commitments. We are one because we are all subjects of the God of love and grace. But all these unities have no relationship whatsoever to the question of a genuine union of Orthodox with those of other creeds. Yet Orthodox ecumenists, at least in the persons of their leaders, ascribe tremendous significance to these vague unities, pointing to the words of St. John the Theologian. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Yes, in apostolic times, such a confession of faith in Christ was sufficient to distinguish who was with Christ's church and who was against her. At that time, the chief opponents of the apostles were the Gnostics, who, in their science falsely so called, admitted no direct contact between God and his creatures, since they denied the incarnation of God, the basic dogma of Christianity. But when other heresies made their appearances after the time of the apostles, Christian dogmas had to be reaffirmed in terms of new heresies, 
and those who did not accept these reaffirmations became heretics, opponents of the Holy Church, as had occurred earlier with those who did not confess that Christ came in the flesh. For example, Iconoclasts confess that Christ came in the flesh, as Protestants do nowadays, but for a whole 200 years the iconoclasts enervated the church. There is not a single heresy that caused more evil to the Orthodox Church than iconoclasm, which the Holy Church has condemned and placed under perpetual anathema. By pointing to the aforementioned words of St. John the Theologian, Orthodox ecumenists give the heterodox grounds to think that the Orthodox are ready to unite with them on the basis of a common belief in the incarnate Christ, even though the heterodox still hold to their misbeliefs. So then, if our Orthodox Church has not received from the organizers of ecumenical conferences any announcement of the readiness of heterodox denominations to reunite with the Orthodox faith, and if they have not discussed the question of such a reunion at these conferences, then the question arises, why should our Russian church send them our representatives? What fruit will the participation of our church at these ecumenical gatherings bear? Only evil fruit, of course, and one of these fruits, about which we have already spoken, will be the falling away of the Orthodox and their faith through the violation of the holy canons and the dogma of the church, as confessed in the ninth article of the Creed. There is another evil that arises from representatives of the Orthodox Church participating in ecumenical conferences, a falling away from our holy orthodoxy. We have in mind the familiarity between Orthodox and Christians of other confessions that develops from their ecumenical association. Of course, ecumenists, especially Protestants, are strong supporters of such familiarity between heterodox Christians and orthodox Christians. For without friendship between Western Christians of various confessions and Eastern Orthodox Christians, ecumenism will never be able to realize its goal. An announcement made by Dr. Wissert Hooft, General Secretary of the Ecumenical Council, reveals that the officials of the Ecumenical Council are aware of this. He has said that without the cooperation of Orthodox churches, ecumenism cannot be a truly ecumenical body. As a consequence, the Ecumenical Council does all it can at their ecumenical conferences to strengthen firmly the friendship between non-Orthodox and Orthodox Christians. There is no doubt that the Council provides all manner of material assistance to the Orthodox churches with precisely this goal in mind. Having taken all of this into consideration, we can say that the friendship formed at ecumenical conferences becomes more and more enduring and profound, but, alas, more and more detrimental to the Orthodox Church. The familiarity between Orthodox representatives and their Protestant counterparts carries over into Orthodox countries and produces their friendly associations between Orthodox and Protestants, particularly between Orthodox clergy, on the one hand, and Protestant clergy, on the other. How far these friendly associations go at times can be seen from the following. During their missionary trips to Orthodox countries, Protestant pastors organize meetings with pomp and ceremony in both villages and towns, and they invite Orthodox to them, especially priests. There have even been cases when, in the presence of a great number of Orthodox Christians, Protestant pastors and Orthodox priests have held hands while singing, Oh, how sweet is the union of true brothers! How our Lord Jesus Christ holds us in love! Very often, Orthodox priests and Protestant pastors jointly serve Molebni. At the Geneva Conference 1920, the representative of the Patriarch of Constantinople, Metropolitan Germanos of Thyatira, the representative of the Patriarch of Alexandra, Professor Lucaris, brought to the conference's attention the proselytism that occurs among Christian peoples. They made it clear at that time that such proselytizing was impermissible and contrary to the idea of a rapprochement 
and reunification of the Christian churches. One must understand here the word proselytism as a euphemism for the dissemination of heterodox propaganda in orthodox countries. Metropolitan Germanos submitted a written statement against proselytism to the conference on behalf of all of the orthodox participants in order to put an end to the use of such propaganda in orthodox countries. As if in answer to this, Protestants proceed on the assumption that because they have an ecumenical friendship with the Orthodox, the latter are ready to embrace Protestant doctrines, and as never before they indulge with no restraint whatsoever in their Protestant propagandizing, which has as its goal the union of Orthodoxy with Protestantism and the consequent liquidation of the Orthodox Church. Protestants use the enormous resources at their disposal to disseminate propaganda by means of the press, publishing books and newspapers. In their literature, they not only drag through the mud our veneration of icons, our divine services, and all of orthodoxy, but they also speak contrary to the scriptures. They reject the biblical narrative of God's creation of the world in six days, and do not accept as authentic certain miracles recorded in Scripture. The upshot of all of this propaganda is that a multitude of Protestant sects have sprouted in Orthodox countries, such as Adventists, Baptists, Methodists, Pentecostals, Evangelicals, as well as others. Before ecumenism, no such Protestant propagandizing existed in Orthodox countries as no ties of familiarity existed between Orthodox and Protestants. These friendships, which are being firmly established at ecumenical conferences, impose on the Orthodox representatives a moral obligation not to impede Protestant propagandizing in Orthodox countries. And herein lies the great evil of ecumenism. For every tree, said the Lord, is known by his own fruit. If harm comes to the Orthodox Church from this friendly relationship, then it is clear that the relationship is the work of opponents of the Holy Church. In the case of ecumenism, these opponents are Freemasons. They are the ones who encourage the development of friendly relationships at ecumenical conferences, since they are the ones who organize these self-same conferences, just as they organize the conferences of the YMCA. In 1928, a conference was held in Sofia between representatives of Orthodox churches and representatives of the International Committee of the YMCA, including representatives of national federations of the YMCA in Orthodox countries, under the leadership of the General Secretary of the International Committee of the YMCA, Dr. John Rowley Mott, a well-known Freemason. At his directive, the All-American Protestant Congress allocates enormous sums of money for worldwide Protestant Masonic propaganda. The second of these conferences took place in 1930 in Athens. The Oxford Conference held in 1937 had as its organizer and spokesman none other than the same well-known Freemason, Dr. John Mott. As a member of the steering committee of the Ecumenical Council, in January of 1948, he participated in the development of the Agendum for the upcoming Amsterdam Conference and in all aspects of its organization. And this same Dr. John Mott will be one of the spokesmen at the Amsterdam Conference. In view of all this, it is no surprise that 80% of the participants at the Stockholm Life and Work Conference in 1925 and at the La Zane Faith and Order Conference of 1927, were members of the YMCA, an organization with Masonic ties and headed by the same Dr. John Mott. Highly relevant to all of this is the report made by participants of the Oxford Conference at the Foreign Council of Hierarchs with Clergy and Laity in 1938 that revealed that the Oxford Conference had been dominated by Freemasons. From this, it is obvious who really stands behind the ecumenical movement, Freemasons, longtime foes of the Orthodox Church. It is also clear to what end the ecumenical movement, at all of its gatherings since its inception, has striven, 
not a dogmatic union of all so-called Christian churches with the Orthodox Church, but a co-mixture of both, achieved by means of the falling away of the Orthodox from their faith through an ecumenical familiarity with heretics, especially with Protestants. This co-mixture is equivalent to the destruction of orthodoxy. Ultimately, when dealing with the ecumenical question, we must recognize that, going back to the very origin of ecumenism, there stands before us not only the age-old enemies of our orthodox church, but the father of lies and ruin himself, the devil. In former centuries, he sought to destroy the holy church by assaulting her with all sorts of heresies, specifically by trying to mix orthodox with heretics. And he is doing this now by using ecumenism and its inexhaustible Masonic capital. However, earlier there were more obstacles to his work than there are now. Back then, Christians had a flaming zeal for the orthodox faith and defended it to the point of giving their blood as martyrs. Nowadays, those who embrace orthodoxy are unparalleled in their indifference to the faith, an indifference that God loathes. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. As a result of their zeal for the faith and their pure Christian lives, Orthodox were granted knowledge from God. Theologically unenlightened people, even simple women, argued at the marketplace over whether Christ was of the same essence, homoousius, or of the similar essence, homoousius, to God the Father. Nowadays, an ignorance in questions of the faith reigns among the Orthodox, and the foe of our salvation is taking advantage of this. The ecumenical movement has quickly grown over the face of the earth, ensnaring even Orthodox churches in its intricate webs. Yet the Russian church, possessing 50 million Orthodox faithful, so far has not become a member of the ecumenical movement. For the present, then, ecumenism will not celebrate its victory. It has not encircled all of the Orthodox churches in its worldwide ring. Let us not give it such a victory. Let us remember its essence and its aim, and let us wholly reject the ecumenical movement. It constitutes a falling away from the Orthodox faith, a betrayal of and treason against Christ, which are things that we must avoid in every way so as not to fulfill the words of St. Seraphim. Woe to him who even in one iota falls away from the holy ecumenical synods. The world is hostile to Christ and his holy Orthodox Church, and for this reason the friendship of the world, in the words of the Holy Apostle, is enmity with God. The Orthodox Church should never join with those of other confessions. Such a union is unfeasible, utopian, and extremely harmful and even disastrous for the Orthodox Church. Orthodox Christians should, rather, join with each other and so fulfill the commandment of Christ. Neither pray I for these alone, i.e. the apostles, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. In this context, the word all means believers, and the word believers here does not signify orthodox together with ecumenists and heterodox Christians. One can only understand the word to mean true believers, i.e., orthodox Christians. As God declared, I am the truth, he could not have meant here heretical Christians, but rather only right-believing ones. Let us not be disturbed by the accusation ecumenists make against us Orthodox Christians of lacking love toward Christians of other creeds, for our seeming not to want to include them in our faith. This accusation is, above all, not based in reality. Our Holy Church has always fought against heresies, even unto blood, yet she has always pitied those who, at the suggestion of the devil, fall into heresies, and moved by love for them, 
she places upon them an epitemia, penance, which even goes as far as excommunicating them from the church. Nonetheless, the church has never ceased and never will cease her prayers, this breath of grace-filled true love, for the restoration and the return of heretics to the path of saving truth. Here is how the church teaches us to pray for heretics. Those who have departed from the Orthodox Church and have been blinded by destructive heresies, enlighten with the light of thy knowledge and bring back to thy holy apostolic Catholic Church. In this way, the Holy Church differentiates heterodoxy from the truth, demanding of those who have fallen into heresies an uncompromising struggle against their misbeliefs and always reaching out to them with her maternal, loving embrace. For not joining the ecumenical movement as the Orthodox ecumenists have, we are accused of an essential lack of love for non-Orthodox Christians. However, through their involvement in the ecumenical movement, Orthodox ecumenists break the holy canons, violate Orthodox ecclesiological dogma, establish friendships with Protestants and Freemasons in ecumenical gatherings, which makes them lenient toward Protestants propagandizing in Orthodox countries, and assist the enemies of the Orthodox Church in their work for her elimination. The Orthodox ecumenist behavior in their relationship to ecumenism is a complete outrage. It is egregiously unseemly behavior, in which, according to the teaching of St. Paul, there is no love. Love, he says, doth not behave itself unseemly. It is obvious, however, that any lack of love is not to be found with us, but with the Orthodox ecumenists, since they do not express love, but rather behave unseemly. Let them ask their conscience. It will answer them with the truth. At the base of their ecumenical activities and their relations with the heterodox, is there a genuine love for one's neighbor, or is there something else? May God spare us from such love, from such a relationship with the ecumenical movement. May God grant that our Russian church henceforth stay the course of isolation in its relationship to ecumenism and its conferences, a course that it has hitherto maintained. Yes, we are alone, but in our solitude, in this isolation of ours, lies the security for salvation from the destructive onslaught against the Russian church waged by Freemasons, and the security of salvation, not only for the Russian church, but perhaps for the whole ecumenical Orthodox church. Therefore, let us not participate in the ecumenical movement. We need to stay as far away from it as possible. There are some who hope that instead of the Russian church immediately joining as a full member at the Amsterdam conference, it will rather send representatives to act in the capacity of observers from our church. But does it not follow that our presence, even as mere observers, will somehow solely our great Russian church? Our presence at heretical and Masonic societies will have, to a certain degree, the nature of an endorsement of those societies. The words of the Apostle Paul should be wholly applicable to our Russian church. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. Therefore, let us have absolutely nothing to do with any association with the ecumenical movement. Let us be guided in this matter by the words of Holy Scripture. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the impious. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, of St. Seraphim of Sophia, O Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us. Amen.